I was going to start by saying thank you for inviting me, and then I realised actually you'd invited Jenny Stevens. <laughs> I am not Jenny Stevens. I'm um, a colleague. I used to work in Hampshire Museum Service, which has now become Hampshire Cultural Trust, having sort of moved away from local authority control. And Jenny, who is the curator at Andover Museum, was down to, to give uh, a presentation about the aspect of schools and Danbury in the museum, but she can't make it, so she asked me to step in. So I've put something together that is my own voice about this. It's not Jenny's, it's my thing. Um, however, it is, you know, it's great to be here and have the opportunity to talk about this. I'm going to set a bit of context first of all, and then I'll go through um, one session that I was asked uh, subsequent to me leaving the museum service and going to Southampton University where I'm doing my PhD in public engagement and archaeology, but I was asked to develop a session and think about it, so I'll go through that session as well. But I'll start with Danbury Hill Fort, which um, <clears throat> is quite a well-known hill fort, I think. 20 years... <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. You know, I was just thinking uh, this morning, this morning, uh, you know, several people mentioned wow and memorable experiences, and how can you make what you do memorable? So I think having a fire alarm <laughs> is a, a really good way of being memorable. But back to Danbury, Danbury Hill Fort, uh, 20 years of seasonal excavation, uh, Sir Barry Cunliffe, and Actually, it's a site that is interesting because it's managed not by a museum service or a heritage service, it's managed by a countryside service. So the local authority, Hampshire County Council, countryside service, managed Danbury Hill Fort. And if you were to go and take a stroll around Danbury Hill Fort, uh, you'd encounter very little interpretation, a little bit of interpretation, and I'll show you in a minute what is there. But you'd certainly, as part of the countryside management plan, encounter lots of uh, wild and hairy creatures wandering around, which is interesting when you have school groups up there. And talking about wild and hairy creatures, occasionally you get um, big events put on by the countryside service, so Iron Age reenactors uh, and festivals on top of the actual hill fort itself. However, the schools offer until recently, has been very fragmented. And one reason it's been quite fragmented is because the schools who are booking to go to Danbury book through the countryside service, but then they're interested in going to the partner museum, if you like, that is managed by Hampshire Cultural Trust now, the Museum of the Iron Age, that tells the story of the excavations and the hill fort, and that's a separate body. That's now Hampshire Cultural Trust. So there is a, an interesting um, problem in that schools don't know how to go through the administration process easily. And that's a real barrier to them doing the visit, going to the museum, going to the hill fort. And administration is a, is a big thing about you know, what schools do. They do go, and increasingly they go, as we'll see. But pre-national curriculum changes, they often used to go and do a lot of the countryside uh, put together activities that, as an archaeologist, as a museum educator, sometimes uh, me and my colleagues, we'd look at it and think, is that really doing what we'd anticipate could be done at the Hill Fort? So, great fun and memorable experiences. They'd have beanbag battles, so throwing beanbags at each other as a, opposing tribal uh, groups. But actually, yeah, okay, that's fun, and there is, a room, there is room for that sort of activity. But how do you go a step further? And uh, this is something that was a challenge that we all faced when the, the curriculum changed as well. So if you were a school going to uh, Danbury Hill Fort, uh, the picture on the top right shows one of the interpretation panels. There's about three as you go round the site. And that's looking up towards the crest of the hill. And it's quite a steep climb to go up the hill. And if you've got little junior school kids, they can get quite exhausted going around, and it's something teachers often comment on about this outdoor experience, is that it's quite exhausting, and we need to be prepared. And that comes back to the dialogue and the conversation that you have initially. But what they do appreciate is there is a car park. Not all of these sorts of outdoor sites have car parks. The coach can easily get there, can stay there. There is even a toilet, which 
kids can use. If you mention it, every kid will use it, but um, you can use the toilet. And when you get up to the actual top of the hill for, there are managed uh, pathways, safe pathways through the sites that are, that are created as well. And they're all, you know, bonuses, and they're all very positive things about the hill fort. Because the countryside service run the site, the interpretation, and quite rightly, is a very interesting balance between thinking about the heritage, the archaeology, but also the natural history. So the sorts of sessions that you see still being offered and have been offered in the past, very much about natural history, archaeology, and balancing the two, which is Good, you know, it's a good thing to see, that cross-curricular aspect of what they're doing. And most recently, between 2011 to 2013, there was a heritage lottery funded project that did bring the museum and the site closer together because an officer, education officer was made available who was countryside services, but actually their task was to develop, develop a project called Discover Danbury working with schools to get them to help understand how the site could be used. And that officer was based in the museum, and that really helped cement more of a partnership and an agreement between the museum and the Iron Age and what was going on. And here is the museum of the Iron Age. It's, it's based in Andover Museum. Um, and if you look at the map, which I don't know how easily readable it is, but Andover um, sort of sits in the west of the map and Danbury Hill Fort's about seven miles southwest so if you're a school group you visit the hill, hill fort or you visit the museum and then you've got a seven mile journey takes about 15 minutes and it's it's pretty close it's not bad and the Museum of the Iron Age and Andover Museum um, locally very well known Museum of the Iron Age increasingly more sort of regionally and nationally well known with curriculum change and uh, but it has an interesting mix of uh, collections, including the now nearly 25-year-old displays in the Museum of the Iron Age. I know I remember going to the opening event there as well. But 25-odd years old, it's, it's, it's getting on quite a bit. And then you also have, in the Andover Museum side, uh, the typical local history museum, where you've got that chronological view uh, of the past, starting with uh, locals call this character either Scary Mary or Hairy Mary. Um, and, you know, in terms of deep prehistory, it's something that schools never even came to visit. When they came to Andover Museum, a few of them came to do um, the Victorians, few came for local history, some came to do the Iron Age, but they did it, this is pre-national curriculum change, as a precursor to uh, looking at the Romans. And then there was a shock. The shock waves of change came through. I always wonder what happened to this cat, actually. <clears throat> because financial crisis led to organisational change, led to curriculum change later on in, as another driver that came on board. Museum service absolutely restructured, posts went, education posts went, and all of a sudden, fewer people trying to address just as many sites, but also a new curriculum. And that was a challenge. A site I know very well, because I'm doing my PhD research on this site, Basing House. Uh, we've been digging there every year. We've been, I've been looking at how the public and the staff work with the site. Suffered immensely because it's a Tudor period site. And that Tudor period seemed to disappear from the Key Stage 2 curriculum. And, and schools still go, actually. They make their own reasons for going and doing the Tudors at a level, you know, where it's not in the new curriculum. But it's a very, this is a picture of the siege at Basing House, very embattled site at the moment, and their visitor numbers in terms of schools are going down. And they've tried to reposition themselves, just as Andover Museum has. So curriculum changes has a massive impact across the museum service, across the cultural trust. For Andover Museum and Danbury, um, it stimulated even more negotiations between the, the partners, if you like, the Countryside Service, have handed over the administration of the Hill Fort to the Museum Service because they are going through curriculum ch uh, staff cuts and they recognise they can't service or resource uh, what's happening. So that's been a kind of interesting change that's helped Andover Museum a bit because it means teachers find it easier. 
Teachers are looking for tons of support now for their prehistory teaching. And a lot of them, as we said earlier on this morning, have been saying to me and to, and to colleagues, we actually don't, don't really know much about prehistory and we are looking for experts to help us navigate our way through it. And museums and, and, and are seen as the experts in a way. And you know, often they'll feel reluctant for some reason to approach museums. It's often about museums approaching them and saying, we're the experts. Uh, as I say, Basing House... The offer's reconfigured, it's now local history, but prehistory has really taken off at Museum of the Iron Age, because now, a whole new batch of opportunity there. And that has led to new sessions being developed. And uh, as I say, I was asked to, to, to do one of the new sessions. I looked around, I thought, well, what's the resource? We've got a brilliant museum still with, um, you know, displays that age very well, I think, and a whole sort of type of display, lots of different types of display, from dioramas to, you know, objects in cases to reconstructions. You've got a handling collection, which isn't great, full of uh, replica objects. Not, I would say they're not brilliant handling collections in a way, because they're very limited, but there is, there is an opportunity to use that material. And the new session had to be promoted, and thinking of your top tips, how do we promote these sessions? Um, a whole new brochure was produced across the museum service that was very welcoming. Saw the new curriculum not as a sort of prescriptive 1066 and all that. It saw it as something that was an opportunity to grow and change and to try new innovative stuff, basically. So, quick glimpse at this bigger document. You know, welcome. Thinking about the messages that are placed there. And uh, with Andover firmly in the key stage two element looking at changes in Britain from Stone Age to Iron Age. Interestingly, Basing House, local history study now, because um, that's where it seems to fit best. But I started by thinking about how do I connect with um, what schools want, what is it thereafter. I went and talked to our local advisors, so high ass in, in Hampshire terms, Hampshire's inspection and advisory team, and they actually had a really big thing on creativity. And they were saying creativity was really important when it came to outdoor learning, uh, the links that they could make with class teachers and thinking about multi-sensory engagement and all the opportunities that were coming through based on looking at creativity. I went to the primary history conference, talked to teachers, began to trial out, and we mentioned trialing in the top 10 tips, ideas and thoughts. Um, and I thought, you know, let's use their language. Let's use what they're familiar with and what they understand to make a connection. And so the big thing that I did, in, in a sense of me having to learn and move on, was I actually borrowed a process that the, in, the inspector and advisory term team, wow, used. Their six-step process, which basically, see, it's sort of based on a model of learning, I think that you would call uh, accelerated learning, ALPS, and people might have heard of ALPS, but accelerated learning. But basically you're looking at creating the hook, creating something that's really interesting and motivating, and telling you, where are you going to go with this? What's the end product of, of what you're doing? Then, once you've actually scoped the inquiry and, and created that motivation, you then move on to collecting information and doing it in interesting ways, going to a site, going to a museum. Then you make sense of the information. You might want to sort material or, and process it in some way. You then move on to making meaning. So you're actually being asked to do something that is making meaning of that sorting activity or that processing activity. And then you move on a step further. You actually then get them to check their understanding, refine their understanding. And finally, you offer an imaginative output, an imaginative product. So, uh, very quickly, I made up a, a session called Dead Man's Tales. Bodies, as we've learned, are very fascinating to people. Uh, this was about a male skeleton found buried at Danbury in a storage pit, 30, 40 years old. Head down, body down, legs pulled up, and two big blocks of stone on top of them. And actually, you know, what I did then, taking this six step process, using the language that teachers wanted to hear because they were being taught this and, and hearing it at conferences, so motivating them with this dramatic reveal of the skeleton or a, an image of the skeleton in the first place, and then saying your end product is a story, so links to creating that narrative, to really strong core thing about literacy and, and English. Uh, children collecting information in various ways, so they've got the displays, the handling collections. They're generating their own questions from those. 
not my questions, theirs. So they generate questions and then try and answer them. Then they need to make sense of those ideas and process the information, that sorting, grouping, the collections they've got, trying to associate the objects with that person who they are trying to speculate about, infer, coming up with all sorts of you know, ideas. Who is this person? Why were they buried as they were? <coughs> Drawing their own conclusions by creating a story grid, which I'll show you a very quick image of uh, in a minute or so. And then checking understanding, which was the visit to Danbury. So pulling on what they've done and then saying, look, this is the place that this person was found in. And doing that sense of place thing, uh, getting them to do a rotor of activities around Danbury, but all the time challenging them to think about who this person was and where they were buried and, and, and why they were buried there. Really cross-curricular as well, lots of cross-curricular applications. This was the story grid I used. They wrote, used dice, roll the dice in six groups, and each six rolls of each dice will you know, give you six sentences based on a key word or an image. And they're demonstrating their learning because they have to know what the image is because they've handled the object, they've found out what it is, they've gone to the museum, and they're thinking then about generating a, a narrative, a story about this person with those six sentences that they've come up with. And they're all very random and, and, you know, sort of... A lot of people don't like that, do they, in archaeology, the sort of speculation side. I think it's really, really important and necessary. And finally, moving on, two more, three more slides, but very quick. Evaluation is really critical to all of this. So I got teachers to actually um, write down their comments based on thinking about the new session, history and archaeology in the curriculum. They all said pretty much the same thing, which is we need expert support. Uh, there's a bit more prescription, but actually archaeology is a great opportunity for us and we need to understand that and do more about it. And the kids, two sheets, you know, the memory cloud idea of evaluating uh, what people do. Their memorable activities. Well, you know, it's not just complicated ideas, you know, your top tips that I think are really important in this. It's also emotions. So, you know, here we've got, uh, I just about made out the word puzzled in the end. So puzzled, but joyful. And I think emotion is a really important part of learning. And what we can do in archaeology with the sessions we offer is not just get them to think about facts and get them to, to speculate and problem solve. We also are about engaging their emotions. And I think that whole thing about emotional connectivity is really important. Archaeology is brilliant for it. So I'll leave the last word to uh, one of the children who came along and wrote rather than drew. Um, but I will just leave you with a message, you know, capture the learning. This is all part of it as well. Trialing, but evaluate, capture the learning and learn from it. And this is what they say. And think about emotion in this, because I think it's really important. We had to do a mystery. We had some tools that they had in the Iron Age. We had to find it in the museum. And Chris um, made the activities good. I'm glad I put that one in. And he's funny. I wasn't sure if he meant funny, peculiar or funny. I felt scared when I held the bone, because it might have been a living person's bone. We didn't actually hand out any human remains, and we did talk about that. But it's interesting that there's that emotion there. And look at the words. Actually, they broke the rules. They did put three in. Scared, funny, and exciting. And I think, you know, all of those emotions coming out of archaeology. Well, I just want to leave saying, think about emotions in archaeology as well, and emotions in learning. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you.